Good afternoon, everybody. Okay, welcome back to the third lecture of uh, Intelligent Systems. This year, um, we're going to talk about adversarial search again today. So the games that we saw at the very end yesterday and get into more complex games, more details, and so forth. Uh, before doing that, I would like to have some kind of um, organizational questions to you and some comments. So the first one is probably that I'm, I struggled a bit with the video lectures. Um, and I, as I said yesterday, I didn't manage to record the one on Monday. I recorded the two on yes, from yesterday, and I've now set, transformed them to formats so that I can publish them on YouTube, uh, which I will hopefully do tonight. But the recordings themselves are not very good because of the room, the setup of the room. You see a lot of empty space, and the distance between me and the microphone is also not that good. So the material from the first week is more or less the same as the material we had last year. So I recommend you to stick with the material on YouTube from last year. Because this is one story that you can follow if you, if you want to look at the, the material. And the links are online. I will try to publish the lectures from, uh, from uh, this year, also on the YouTube, YouTube channel. But my recommendation is for the first week, stick with the one from last year. Yeah. And there is some of the material is uh, uh, slightly reordered, so I've, um, I've brought some of the complexity results uh, uh, from the, the first lecture. I now move to the fourth lecture. In principle, all the material remains the same, but there's a slightly different logic in the, in the story. Yeah? So, just to remind you of what is coming the next days, I'm going to give you a lecture tomorrow again at, um, uh, I think in this room at 11 o'clock, um, rounding up the topic of, uh, of search, state spaces and search. Um, there will be, most probably, but I will make an announcement of that, a, uh, a student assistant uh, be available in a room to give individual support for people who are sort of struggling with starting up the Python programs to do the, the uh, programming of the intelligent agents. Uh, I will post an announcement of where you can find this person and how we organize uh, the meetings. On Friday, I think it's the most important day. As I said before, there are the working groups where uh, Dalia and Dora will uh, guide you through some exercises with respect to the theoretical material. And uh, so there are worksheets, and you will be with uh, 40, 50 people in the room, and you can ask questions. You will have to try it themselves, yourself to solve the, the exercises. And then Dalia and Dora will try to explain uh, if there are still any questions left. So that's the working group. And I hope that everybody here in the room and everybody who wants to follow the course is registered with one of those groups. It's a bit of a hassle. You have to scroll through all the, the practical assignments group, and then at the very end, you can register with the working groups. But many people have done that, so I expect the rest of you also to be able to do that. Next to these working groups, which are in parallel scheduled at 9, 11, and 1 o'clock, there is also people available for you to help at the other slots when you're not in the working groups. You can go to some of the rooms that are reserved for you in the lab spaces. And you can work there on your first worksheet, on the practical, to get the game engine running, to get, to get your own first uh, uh, bot running. And there will be TAs around. And um, where I believe <coughs> we'll be able to try to uh, give you some sophisticated scheduling system so that you have access to these uh, uh, these TAs in the most efficient possible way, yeah? But there is nothing prepared in these times. It's just free time for you to work. 
with, computer su with support from TAs on Friday. And then there will be the milestone that you have to work on, which is the practical material, so getting everything up and running and look at the first, uh, first uh, intelligent agents and program your own min-max algorithm. And that is uh, uh, what we call the first milestone. The deadline is set on, on Friday now, but that's sort of uh, more indicative. You will not have to hand them in apart from that at the very end. There should be an attachment to the uh, or that you should have them at the very end of the course to make sure that you really worked individually on those agents as well. But if whether you work on them over the weekend, that is fine as well for me. Um, is there anything unclear so far or is there anything um, you think should be improved or changed about the setup of the course or the teaching in general? Um, is there anything we should take care of now? Yeah. If you go to the roster principle and then L, and you just look for the course, so don't look at your personal roster, but go to the course website. So if you go to roster and then L, um, I don't know how to get rid of this. Yep, and you add the roster for a course, and the course would be Intelligent Systems. Or groups. Then I believe you should be able to see all the groups here. Yeah? So this is then the practical group in room. There's one practical group in 201. There's one in 203 and one in 205, yeah? And um, for the working groups, WC, as you see, there are two rooms, and I really would ask you to go to the room that of your, the group you registered with, because otherwise we might end up with 120 people in one room and three in another, and that's not really what we would like to have. Yeah, so please uh, go to the working groups that you've registered to, Feel free to go to any of the other practical sessions, and the room numbers are here. And there are not nine slots for you, so I hope you will find a slot, uh, and there will, should be room in the practical rooms as well. Yeah? Anything else? Do we also post the length of this year or one? Yes. I have not already done that. I have uh, tried and failed miserably, and I'll try again, try again. So I hope the material, both the lecture from yesterday and the slides from this year, will be available tonight or tomorrow morning. Yeah? Okay, so if there are no more questions, let's move to the content of the, the third lecture, and that is, as I said, more on adversarial search and going a bit more into depth. And Remember that uh, we looked at this min-max algorithm, which was an exploration, a search exploration through a state space uh, search tree by looking at the possible utility values, of, which are the values of the end of a game. So do I win, do I uh, lose, or do we play a, a draw? And then trying to always take into account the best possible strategy of your opponent. And that basically meant, means that if you are, want to maximize the score, you let your, your opponent play. So you have a min-max of your opponent, and you choose the maximum value out of it. Yeah? Let's look at this in more detail. This was the, the example I gave. And basically, you first you start, if you want to know what the value of your top node is and what the best strategy is to, to play such a game, you have to start at the end of the game and have to propagate the results of the game up to the top of the root, uh, to the root of the, the tree. So here uh, we have this example that if a max player has the choice between losing and winning, of course he will choose a winning strategy. So then he can gain here, win the game. And if a min player has the choice of choosing a zero value, then she will choose a zero value. But in such a game as this one, you will find out that whatever Max does, she will win because she can always find the strategy of 
following the one with the, the with the one bounce. And that could either be this move or this move. Anyway, she can enforce that you end up in a one state. Now, the this assumption is yeah. Sorry, um, the last, the last, uh, Uh, this is where you can apply this really up to the end because you can calculate to the end state. Yeah? But I'm getting now into the situation where in chess, for example, you can't go to the end game because there's too much. But there's one intermediate step, and that intermediate step is that here we only looked at winning or losing. And obviously, in real games, you have more than winning or losing, you have also winning with certain points. So um, another question we have Romanian, my Romania question do we have any Australians in the room? Do you follow cricket? Yes? So uh, my commiseration, do we have any Indian people in the room? Congratulations. So the question is, uh, who of you understands anything about cricket? Probably exactly those four people in the room. And uh, so the point is that with Schnapsen, for example, you can win with 10 points. And, but cricket is a game in which you can win in very, very many different ways. So you can win by an innings, which is very strong if you win by an innings, because you basically have one round where the, the opponent doesn't, is allowed, even allowed to play. But then you can also win by wickets and by points. So the only point I want to make with this long story is that there are games where the rules of winning are rather complicated. And in football, you have uh, a 7 to 3 or a 1 to, to 0. So in a way, we need a more differentiated, a more, a more clever way of assigning values to, to end states in our game. And basically, what you do is to say, we don't only look at values 1, 0, and min minus 0, but we can apply our algorithms to anything where we have a linear ordering or a, an ordering of the natural numbers, where the highest number is the best, so you win with 12 points and then you win. And that's uh, better than if you win with 8 points. And if you win with 14 points, that is, is even better. So Max wants to maximize this utility value of your end state in the game. And Min tries to minimize it. Yeah. And uh, so we now abstract away from the one innings, uh, three runs score at the end of a game, maybe um, just to uh, uh, the natural numbers. But the same idea in principle applies as we had before. We have the, the maxim, maxim player who wants to maximize his or her gaining value. And whenever I, I write down 12, you could also read an innings and 123 runs or uh, with one point or two points or three points in Schnapsen because we have a similar idea here that if you win the game with Schnapsen, you have 66 points and your opponent has uh, 50 points, then you get one point at the end. If your opponent has less than 30, you get two points. And if your opponent has no cards at all, then you get three points. And a proper game of Schnapsen is played over seven points. So if you win twice with three points and once with two, then you win. So a proper tournament <laughs> is over more than one game. So that's, uh, but to simplify, we look now only at utility values as, as a natural numbers, and in principle, you can apply the same algorithm as we had before. So, what's the intuition again? If in the last phase of the game, Min is the one who has can set a move, then what will be the best move Min can make? Yeah. So this move. So the best Min can achieve in this move, if it is in this situation, is a three, it's a two in this situation, and it's a two in this situation. Yeah. And then obviously the question is what is the best that Max can achieve when she starts the game? What is the strategy that Max should choose in order to maximize her chance of uh, winning or winning with the highest utility is to choose the, the three. And then if everybody plays optimally, then the game will apply this strategy for the max player, Min will choose this one, 
and you will end up in this situation. And that is the algorithm in uh, pseudocode. You want to calculate, uh, you have a function, min max decision, and it returns an action. So first you calculate the value of a state, and then you choose as your action the successor state with the highest expected value. That's what we did here. So if you really want to play the game, you choose this action because it gives you the highest v-value. Yeah? So um, you now have a function max value. And um, what it does, it returns you a utility value. So the expectation, what is the best that max can achieve after playing to the end of the game. And this max, um, once, once you have this, once you know which is the highest value, you can choose the appropriate action. So what does max do? It um, tests whether it's a terminal, so whether it's a leaf node of the tree, and if it is, then it just returns the value um, the, the, of, the util of the node itself. So that's the end of the game, basically. So that's the recursive step where we're done with the calculation. And then if, you, um, uh, if you're not in a terminal state, you need to apply recursion to it. And what you do, you look at the successors of my state and you calculate the maximum you can achieve of the value itself and the, the, the biggest value that uh, min, uh, um, the, the smallest value that min will give you. Yeah, that was exactly the step one up. And Min, um, min is called here on the same state, on the, the successor state, and it does the opposite. So it checks whether it's a terminal test. If it's a terminal load, then it gives you the utility value back. If it's not, it just checks which one is the minimal value of the best move that Max can give me underneath. Yeah, And I would really recommend you to take a, a tree like the one I've shown you before, or one that you get in the exercises, and really do the calculation by hand with this algorithm, just to understand it. And that's the basic algorithm that you should implement um, uh, in the first week, uh, maybe with some improvement. And it all depends on the utility state of the game. So knowing that after playing several rounds of your game, you know whether you win or lose, or how much you win or how much you lose. There is a proof that uh, of course, we now run the algorithm under the assumption that min plays uh, optimally. So she always uses the minimal value uh, in the calculation. And there is an easy proof that Max will even do better when min doesn't play optimally. So if she doesn't play, choose the minimal value but a bigger one, then Max will still win the game. Uh, and uh, so we, we can assume that if, uh, if we apply this algorithm, we are good. Some uh, of the properties, we discussed the properties of algorithms last, uh, in the last lecture. For the simple algorithms here, uh, we have completeness. We always find uh, the best strategy. Uh, we have a an relatively bad time behavior. We have a, a b to the power of m, where m is the, 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 the maximal depth of where you would find the best solution in this case. Uh, the space complexity is okay because you can do it in a kind of depth first way, this calculation. Uh, and it's optimality, it's optimal. So if you run the algorithm, it will always give you the best possible strategy to win the game. So this is the first part of what you should do for the milestone to the end of the week. Um, and that is implement the, the, the second phase of the Schnapsen game. And as you rightly said, in the second phase of the Schnapsen game, we know exactly which cards I have, which my opponent has, and then I can uh, perform a perfect information game uh, min-max algorithm. The search space is reasonably small with only 14,000 nodes. Um, and you can start on the worksheet, run some experiments with existing boards, and implement the min-max algorithm on top of those, of these properties. Yeah? So now we understand how these games work. We can apply the same algorithm for chess. Is that so? No. We cannot, of course, because um, 
So very easily said, if we just look at uh, games of chess, they run very, very, very long. They can run forever, even in infinite loops. So there's no way for us to determine the utility values in the first place. But then even if we had sort of knew that all the, the games would be finite, then even then we would have billions and billions of different combinations to play with. And neither the, the space complexity or the time complexity would allow us to do that in a, in a reasonable way. Um, and in other cases, such as Schnapsen, uh, it's a different problem. We have the problem of uncertainty. So we don't really know what, in the first phase of Schnapsen, what the cards are that our opponent plays with. So theoretically, the uh, min-max algorithm is very nice. But in practice, we have some problems with it. And uh, so we have uh, three strategies for taming the beast, the complexity, and the problems with the, these games. And um, this is what I'm going to talk about in this lecture, basically. The first one is uh, the problem of this length of the games. So in uh, Go, I was told yesterday, we have 19 by 19, uh, so uh, uh, a lot of states. I can't do the, the calculation. A, a lot of choices in the beginning. And a game, as well, runs a long time. So there are hundreds of moves that you could, could uh, take before you sort of get a, a, into a, a winning game or a losing game. So that's impossible to do. In chess, the same. We have a standard length of a game is 25 uh, moves. So there's no chance to really calculate the full length. And even then, loads of this, the states wouldn't have finished. The games wouldn't have finished. So in a way, we need to cut off the depth of the surge that we have. So we need to say, OK, we, in our estimation of what the best move is to take in our min-max algorithm, Let's not look at the end until we know exactly the value of our states according to winning or losing. But let's cut off at an arbitrary length of 5 or 10 or 15, whatever you think works for your case, and stop then with the search. And then basically what we need to do is at the, at the nodes that we stop the search at, we need to assign a value, uh, a heuristic value. We looked at heuristics yesterday. Basically, we have to say in our exploration phase, okay, this move, this strategy will give me, get me to a situation where my chances of winning are far, much, far higher than if I do another move. So at the cutoff, we need some evaluation. We need basically heuristics for min-max. So instead of using the utility values of a state as an estimation for the quality of a leaf node, what we have to do now is to say we stop the search and assign some estimation of how good this node is uh, to all those leaf nodes. Yeah? I don't. I'm just losing completeness. So basically what, what you do here is you say, uh, I will not find the optimal strategy. I would still find a very good strategy, maybe, depending on how good my heuristics is. But this is, the, this is exactly the place where you give up your, your completeness. So the utility values were some kind of um, assignment of values of an end state of a game in terms of winning or losing. So you could win by an innings and three wickets. You could uh, have uh, 33 points, the other player 69. So that would then translate into three points for X and one point and so forth. We've seen that. Um, a heuristic value, we are not in a situation yet where we can assign those utility values. We have to do some estimation on the quality of the, the states. Yeah? Uh, so in two situations where you have such a huge state space, you First ones, you always want to make sure cut off one of the biggest possible, but in the second one, you want to just start by the end one. 
So the question for the people in the back, you probably couldn't hear it, was that there are two different kinds of uh, uh, situations where you would need to do this cutoff. The one is where you know that the search space is so big that you can't handle it in, in memory anymore. And the second one is where you uh, might have an infinite loop. Um, so my answer would be that uh, uh, if you have an, this infinite loop, you can probably reduce your situation by just doing, doing some additional trick to reduce it to a game where you could use the complete information. And you wouldn't need to cut off by exactly, as you say, doing the uh, uh, checking off whether there is a, a duplication, for example. Duplication checking would be one way of turning your second situation into a one that we could handle. I think the main use for this, this uh, strategy of cut off, cutting off is because of the memory, uh, the, 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 the complexity of the state space. Yeah? Because the utility tells you whether you actually won, and the heuristics tells you, tell you whether you will probably win. And I think if I know if I have the choice of betting for someone who tells me I know how the game ends, and someone who tells me I believe the game will end, I know where I would put my money. Yeah. So um, of course there are heuristics that work very well and that are almost certain to give you the right results, but in many of the heuristics, in the games particularly, this is not the case. Yeah. So let's look at some of the heuristics in chess. I hope everybody is more or less familiar with the, the, the rules of chess. It's always a very good example for these heuristics. So you could, for example, think that two pawns and a bishop is stronger than a castle. So you, you assign values to these, uh, uh, these different figures in chess. And then, um, so as far as I remember, I, I used to learn that uh, the, the pawn and the bishop is, uh, is, uh, has value three, and a, uh, a castle has a value five, so three plus three is, is bigger than five. So that would be my heuristic that I always taught, uh, was taught when I learned chess. Uh, and but in, in our case, it's, it's uh, for, for Schnapsen, it could be that if you have a situation where you have uh, played an ace, and that means your card value that you have is uh, bigger than 20, then it's better than a situation where you haven't played this card and your card value is three. You had a question? No, just two pawns and bishop and castle is exactly equal. Pawn is equal one. Plus three is five. Castle is five. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. You're, you're right. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, what, what is the name of the... Anyway. Um, so basically what you do then is you, you do exactly the same. So you start with your situation, your, your, your initial uh, game situation, and you explore all the possible transitions in different uh, game situations. And after some time, you just say, OK, now my memory is full, or my time is up. Uh, and then you say, OK, now I, I look at all the situations in which I could be at the time and I assign some value, some estimate, estimated quality of these nodes in the tree um, by some heuristics. And of course, as you said here, um, there, there can be a lot going on underneath in the real tree, which we don't really consider, which we don't really understand. And um, that is why this is an incomplete algorithm. We could, we could easily end up with wrong predictions and wrong strategies. Um, so the reason is, in this case, basically what we do is that we move from a perfect information game to an imperfect information game. So we assume that, okay, we can only look at our game in such a depth that we, we have to ignore the rest of the information. So we end up with imperf uh, imperfect information. And that's an idea that goes back uh, 60, 70 years of Shannon saying, okay, in some cases you might have perfect information, like in chess, but you have to trade perfect information with performance in these cases. And that is something that I think we are now understand very well, but it's still a, a big step and a leap to say, I have all this information and I throw it away in God's name. Is that a good plan or not? And for Schnapsen, we actually, in phase one, we do it a, a little bit different. The algorithm that I will show you at the very end of this lecture does exactly the opposite. So you have an imperfect information game, and you do as if you have a perfect information game, 
you run it several times, you sample over it, and you get some strategy out of the assumption that, oh yeah, I, have, I know the opponent's cards, and what would happen if I played against this opponent the best possible way, or some random way even, and I base my strategy on the assumption that, that, that I have perfect information. So both directions are valuable in these kind of AI problems. Of course, now we get into the problem of having to decide what uh, a good evaluation strategy is. So the question is, how can we say this node, which I've reached after five or 10 or 12 steps, is better than another state that I've reached? Um, so basically, the, this evaluation function should work similarly to the utility function. So if I know the utility, my, my evaluation should have the same, give the same ordering. Um, one other thing that's very important is that the evaluation is fast. So I spoke about the trade-off between very good heuristics that almost give you the perfect heuristic value and some that are very trivial and easy to calculate but don't give you much information. And it's exactly the, the for every game that we are implementing, the big decision is what is the right evaluation strategy that's very cheap so that we can do a lot of exploration properly as opposed to a very, very good heuristic that almost tells us perfect, perfectly whether I win or not, but it costs a lot of time to calculate and we never finish our algorithm in the first place. Um, so in, in a way you can think of this evaluation function of giving you a probability or an estimation for the actual chance of winning the game. And once we agreed on that, we can simply apply the min-max algorithm as we, looked, as we looked at it in the beginning of the lecture. And then there are some, some uh, interesting things that you can play around with, and that is you can come up with one heuristic value for a game state, um, but you can also think of different ones. So you can, uh, uh, so here there's nothing to say, it's where sort of chances of winning and losing is 50-50, uh, but if you, um, so black is to move, and that it says that white is slightly better. So that would be probably something that many chess players would agree with, because the position that black has, that white has reached, is, is more offensive. It's more, um, it's taking the game to the black player, and um, so. Um, but that's very difficult to get into numbers. But we could, for example, say count the numbers of opposition players in the quarters uh, of your opponent, something like this. We can also have the simple one where we just count the, the, the figures that, have, that are still on the field or that have already been taken out of the field. That will give us a useful ordering. That's probably the one that every beginning chess player learns, and there might be more. And in principle, what we can easily do is to calculate our evaluation function as the weighted sum of all these heuristic functions, values that we assign to those states, where the assumption is that those heuristics are independent. If they are not, you will just sort of mess up with your weights because then uh, if the one increases, the other one will also increase, so you, you give a higher weight to it than it might deserve. But that's the sort of something where humans start with these exercises in, in, in these game implementations, we really have to now think of what would be a good estimation for our game situation, whether it's good or not, whether I'm going to win or not. So this is really where the human expertise comes in into those games. So even if you look at uh, the, um, uh, uh, the chess uh, uh, really supercomputer uh, chess programs, even those are based on a lot of human strategies. They are also actually based on learning. So I, I talk about that in a minute. You had a question? When, when you're talking about the weighting, um, let's say we had a binary decision whether to sacrifice your, your queen or not, and thus it puts you in a half and branch for each and every one goes two moves to the other three, for example. When you're talking about the weighting, are you saying that uh, you try and go for the highest weighted average branch rather than going for a branch that 
So the question to summarize it is, uh, so, so how do you come to these weightings or what is the role of those weightings in designing an evaluation function? Um, so, so I think this is really a, a way, more meant as a way of thinking as a human being as how would you get your expertise of your game into your estimation of the quality of the situation. So um, if you are a, a, a star chess player, you will definitely assign different values to the different heuristics. So probably uh, an, a, a professional chess player will far more look at the, the, the state in which you are in your game as opposed to the number of, of uh, figures that you still have on the board. So if I would play the game, if I would have to develop a heuristics, probably I would give 90% of the weight of my estimation of the quality of the game to this heuristics. Just counting the numbers of the, 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 the figures I have, that is, is the, the safe bet. And someone who would play differently, who would, would maybe write a more aggressive uh, game engine, would put more weight on this strategic thing and maybe sacrifice it for a heuristic that takes uh, this into account. And that gets, gets us to the point of... Uh, uh, the, the, the problems with these heuristics, and this is a, a famous game that was played more than 150 years ago. Um, it's called the Immortal Game, it's one of, meant as one of the most beautiful games in chess. And if you look at uh, how white plays and black plays, then you see that, that white is opening up uh, the game. White is trying to position its figures toward the uh, black king. And black is sort of uh, moving back, but it's still, you will see in a minute, that black one by one wins more figures. So our simple strategy of uh, going with the heuristics of as many figures as possible is uh, the one that uh, would, would not have gotten us to this game. So now uh, you will see that the situation closes around the king here, while uh, black wins a number of figures sort of on the wrong end of the field. So on one, one heuristic here guides white to, um, to really go on the attack. Um, and it, it loses here, I think it loses the, 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 the castle. And um, here at this time it loses the queen. But this is the moment when it does the checkmate. And this is the sort of the, the, the finished game. And as you can see, this is a situation where uh, white has hardly any powerful figures left, and black has uh, everything in principle still, and still the attacking heuristics was the more valuable one here, and really got uh, white to win the game. This is obviously a sort of anecdotal example, but it's just to show you that there are different heuristics that might be competing, and uh, it's difficult for us to uh, write the right algorithms that estimate the quality of a move. Here is another example. It's a bit tricky to, to see, but this is a white pawn, and uh, you know you see if you know uh, chess that once white can have the move of moving the pawn to the the end line of black, then it will get the queen, and it will get will win the game. Yeah. So basically, this is a winning position for white. Um, now the question is in, in, the, uh, in this evaluation, how far, how far do I have to look ahead in order to see that eventually white will uh, be able to convert its pawn into queen and win the game? And what actually happens is that um, um, I believe there are a lot of moves that, that the king can make um, oh no, it's, it's this, uh, here is the, the castle of black. Black is on the move, and black has to stop white making this move. So black is actually, um, will lose the game at the moment when it can't set chess anymore. So basically, black will say chess once, chess twice, because white will move this direction. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and after six moves, white will win. But 
this kind of long-term vision of when is the game finished is very, very difficult to estimate if you build a heuristics. So you don't want to, to, to play all these games in order to calculate your, your heuristics because otherwise your heuristics would be so expensive that it doesn't make sense to have them as heuristics. But still you want to look ahead. And the question is how much do you look ahead as opposed to reacting more quickly? So I think the development in the past uh, years is, and that's why also we had these successes in, uh, in, uh, in Go is that many of those heuristics can also be learned. And they can be learned from uh, previous games. So you just look at thousands and thousands of games in situations, and you compare how human experts actually played. You can also check databases of thousands of games. You just check the, the situations you're in, and you see, OK, in these databases, this game has been won that many times. So that would be really a database driven, data-driven heuristics according to how humans played the game before. But in machine learning in, in Go, you can even go a step further. So you write a, your own machine, which is relatively simple, maybe some random elements. You have your machines play against each other, and you take the, the winning ratio of your, your own algorithms that play against each other as a learning input to your learning system in order to learn the heuristics on how to move in the next move. We'll get into that in the third week of the game. So these heuristics are usually typically one of the places where you would say, here is something I can do. Here is something I can, um, can change the, the, the outcomes of my game. Here I can make my, my machine, my bot, more intelligent than another bot. So in the final project, I think playing around with these heuristics, either knowledge-based or learning-based or based on your own knowledge of the game of the Schnapsen, this is really where you can make a difference and where you can now investigate in your research that you do for your final project, what works better? Does it make sense to look ahead five steps, know more about the game, but it will take me longer? Or does it more, make more sense to, take, to learn more and so forth? So that would be the task for the research to do. And now I suggest we take a 15 minutes break and I see you at Half past uh, two, it is. <laughs>